everybody. Uh, we are so glad that you're here. I'm Rick, if you don't know. My name's Rick. I typically preach here on Sunday morning, and I am blessed with the opportunity to introduce to you John, a.k.a. Johnny Shank. So why don't you all welcome Mr. John. Hello, Rick. And uh, this, he is coming all the way from... Council Bluffs, Iowa. Iowa. He's a Hawkeye. Well, actually, he, no, uh, not. he's don't, not. Don't even say that word yeah, around me, okay? okay? Yeah. Or, or, or uh, what is it, Buckeye? Don't even say that. The Buckeye, Ohio Hawkeye. State University. That's okay. right, yeah. But um, he's going to be bringing the word to us this morning, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you to him. Many of you know uh, Mr. John. Many of you don't. So uh, when, how long has it been since you've been here? Uh, I think I left around... Uh, 1994, 95. Where's my wife? I can't see her. Was that right? She, 97. 97. Yes. So 20 years. That's a long time. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, that's a really long time. Now, do you have 40, any kids? Yes, I have one daughter, Lindsay. Some of you remember Lindsay. She's 31. What are you about? I'm, I'm like 30. No, you're not. Yeah. He's like, I know I'm a good looking guy, yes. but it's like, I know, you know, I have to deal with it all the time for so my you wife. you'd be so. like my, my son. Yes, okay. I can call you daddy. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, did you have your daughter here, or did you have her somewhere else? We had her here, yes. Uh, my wife went through a lot of complications and through a lot of prayers. A lot of people prayed for my daughter, Lindsay, right? And uh, about five years after we were married, we had a daughter, and that was it. God bless us with one daughter, Lindsay. Very so, cool. Yeah. Well, we are so glad to have you here. I'm going to pray for you, and then okay. we're excited to hear what you have to say. Okay, so let's right. pray together. Father in heaven, uh, we just give you thanks for John and um, his wonderful wife being able to travel all the way from Iowa and drive, uh, Lord, to be able to share with us this week. And we just pray that you would just um, speak to our hearts in such a way that would encourage us and edify us and lift us up, Lord. And we thank you for um, John and his ministry and his heart for you and his love for your kingdom. And Lord, we just pray for him that um, your spirit would work through his mind and his heart in such a way that he could recall everything that he has studied and prepared for today. Uh, Lord, we pray for our VBS week and our carnival this afternoon. We are so excited just to share with each other, love each other, and uh, worship you through your word and song and fellowship. And so, God, we're just so thankful for this morning. We love you, Lord. We love you, and we love the cross. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, buddy. How's everybody doing? Good. It's, it's just like there's this like bright light up here. Do you see it off my forehead? It is like it, it is like really bright up here, and it's really hot. Um, does anybody have a fan or anything like that? No. Anyway, I'm glad to be here this morning. It's been a long time coming. Uh, really appreciate being here. Let me just tell you some things that I have found out since I've already been here. Uh, everybody looks great as they get older. So. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, um, some people have a little gray hair, gray hair. Where's George Zabatakis? Does George play Santa Claus at Christmas time? I don't know, but uh, we don't do Santa Claus. But I did, I did find out a flaw in this church building. Uh, you guys built it a long time ago, but let me just tell you, I was in Clyde's office, and I've also been in, is his name Dr. Maggi? What's his name? Maggio, his office, I've seen his office, i also seen Rick's office, they're total chaos and a mess, right? And if you go into Clyde's office, it is like so perfect, right? Is that true? Everything is so organized. I got some paper clips and I put it on his desk and he, he knew right away that those paper clips were right there. He's, where did these come from? Did you bring these in here, John? Yes, I did, Clyde. Please forgive me. Okay. Well, any, here's the flaw that I found. That, that, that office there. It has a bathroom in there, correct? Has anybody ever used that? You know there's a bathroom in there, right? I don't know how that came about, but he, Clyde has his own bathroom. And uh, I had to use the bathroom. Well, do you know that there is a Sunday school class that's right next to it? And jo George was uh, talking in his class, and I can hear George, and I'm like, this is a great Sunday school class. By the way, you know, if you're not in this class, you need to be there. Uh, and if you have to go to the bathroom, guess what? You can hear every word that he says. And so I'm thinking, oh my goodness, they probably hear everything that I'm doing in this bathroom. <laughs> so if you were in George's class and you actually heard some stuff going on, uh, just forget about that stuff and get it in your mind, okay? And I've got some stories to talk about people. How many of you love stories? Okay. 
I'll tell you what, I'm looking out here and I see so many people that I could just talk about and talk about and talk about. And uh, so for the next minutes or something like that, I'm going to share some people that I know because I have been waiting I don't know how many years to talk about people. No, we don't do that in this church, right? But I will tell you this, I love stories. Is Lou Parsons here? Lou's not here and Diane is here. I was talking to Rick and I, he was asking me about you know, uh, First Christian Church and how long ago you were there and how you were with these people and stuff like that. And I said, I was with these people at the time when we were all praying for everybody to get married. And now they all have kids. And I don't know their kids, but I still know their moms and dads. And uh, I have a lot of stories to tell uh, if you want me to. So here's what I thought we would do. Instead of just telling stories because it's been a long time, you know, why don't we just all hang out with each other and just hug on each other and just love on each other for church? Wouldn't that be a great thing? Yeah. Who wants to hear Rick preach? And who wants to hear John preach? And who wants to hear Clyde preach? Let's just love each other because that's what we all need. Amen? So I'm back there and I'm reminiscing about a whole lot of stuff that's taking place. Uh, you know, that have taken place in... in uh, and as I'm coming up through this secret room back here, there is this pulpit. And I know that Rick is from a black pul pulpit. I don't even know where. I don't even know if we call them pulpits anymore. So I'm looking at this stuff, this, this pulpit, and I'm going, you know what? I think that came from the old church. And I preached on this pulpit before. And I'm like, I'm going to preach on this pulpit. And you know how I know this? Because there would be times where we would tape little notes up here and you can see where the tape has pulled off some of this stuff and you know we have our hands like this and I'm like maybe God will you know bless me in some way <laughs> I don't know no but uh, you know it is good to be here if you have your Bibles I'm going to ask you to turn to Genesis the first chapter uh, we're starting uh, I'm going to be here for the next do I have to stay in a certain Rick, because when I walk out of here, it's like my mic just kind of fades. We're in Genesis, and we're going to go through Genesis very quick here. Uh, so if you have an electronic device or a Bible or what have you, if you don't have a Bible, look to the person next to you. What is that? It's a Bible. So um, we're going to cover a lot in a short amount of time. But like I said, I, I like stories, and um, we're going to begin in Genesis, the first chapter in verse 1. And I think many of you know, know this uh, uh, creation. It's a thing that I don't want you to do. Okay? So I'm giving you a precept at the very beginning. Here it is. Don't tune me out. A lot of times is because you and I know the, the creation narrative. Uh, like the back of our hand. It's like, oh, goodness gracious, I've heard it so long. You've been in a... fall asleep, I want you to listen to some things here, because we have a lot of ground to cover in a short amount of time. We want to kick this, uh, is it, is it, dark off right, amen? And I know that Rick and some others have been preaching some things, leading you up to this about the wonder of God. Well, God is an amazing God, amen? Okay, so in Genesis 1-1, I'm going to ask you to stand, uh, and uh, let's honor God, and let me just read Genesis 1-1. Uh, we'll pray together, and then we'll get started. How about that? Okay, let's... In Genesis 1-1, the Word of God says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your wonderful words. Uh, Lord, from beginning to end, especially here in Genesis 1, Father, you remind us over and over again that you are the God of all creation. You created everything that we lay our eyes upon. And that includes us, God. We're the pinnacle of your creation. And so, Father, I pray in the time that we have here, the short time that we have here, uh, that we'll be excited to be here. We already have been blessed, Lord. Uh, we've sang some songs. We were able to commune with you uh, in worship and, and give. And, and now, Father, it's a time for us to be blessed as we open up your word. And I ask, Lord, that you would bless it. And thank you for this wonderful, great opportunity that I can stand here before my home church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
You may be seated. Okay, so many of you have probably got an outline uh, with you here this morning. Uh, you can follow along as we go along. Fill in the blanks uh, as you wish. Write some notes or whatever you want to do. Uh, but here's what I thought we would do. Uh, typically we talk about Genesis and it's in the beginning. Amen? We're going to change it and we're going to call it in plural. Uh, because in the few moments that we have together today, we're going to cover a massive amount of territory. And along the way, uh, we're going to look at some things. And what we're going to look at real quick is we're going to look at. We're going to look at the down. And then we're going to look at the flood. So it's a it's a lot of information. And then after each one of those. Oh, great. You're going to throw. Didn't want this to happen. Rick. fault yes don't blame it on the tech guys right they do everything right so anyway and so we're going to look at this and uh uh we have this brand new beginning in the garden of eden a brand new beginning out of the garden of eden a brand new beginning after after noah and his family and and the destruction of the flood and uh maybe we could look at it like this movie sequels like rocky one Rocky 2, Rocky 3. Or maybe if you go back to 1993, how about if we do it this way? Uh, Jurassic, uh, Jurassic. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm on, the, on this, okay? Jurassic 1, Jurassic 2, and Jurassic 3. So this is what we're going to do. Beginning 1, beginning 2, beginning 3. And so we're going to start with beginning 1, and of course that would be the Garden of Eden, Okay. Uh, we can read about that in chapters 1 and chapter 2, but for the sake of time, what I want to do is read from Genesis, the second chapter, verses 8 through 14. Just listen to what the Word of God says and take it all in, okay? Here's what it says. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of good, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became uh, four river heads. The name of the first is Pashan. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Why would God put gold in there? <laughs> Because it gets our attention, right? Gold is there. Bedulam and onyx and stone are there. The name of the second river is Gahan. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. Uh, Hedekel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. So you have the Garden of Eden, okay? Um, we talk about the Garden of Eden a lot, don't we? Has anybody ever been to Hawaii before? Anybody? Anybody rich enough to go to Hawaii? Okay. Lori and I had, were blessed to go to Hawaii this last, uh, not too long ago. And uh, we didn't go to the big island where, you know, the volcanoes are going off. But we were blessed to go to, uh, uh, what is it? The, wh which one did we go to? What is it? Oh, Aloha. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, it's where Waikiki is, and a lot of people are there. But when you typically think of Hawaii, you think that it's a place of paradise and beauty, which it is. Um, well, the Garden of Eden is that way. It's like paradise. Uh, the garden is described as a de desirable place. Uh, the word Eden means um, simply fruitful or well-watered, okay, I've been back here for, for just a couple days or just since yesterday, and you all need a lot of water, okay? The places are, look, looks pretty bad. Anyway, Eden has become synonymous, synonymous with, dis, with descriptions of pleasure and unspoiled beauty. Uh, now, many of you have probably read uh, the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2. How many have ever read it before? Raise your hand, okay? You're with me on this? If you haven't read it, it's a great read, but more than that, it's the beginning of all creation. And I would challenge you to read it and study it as much as you can. Uh, here's another thing. 
Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, quoted from the Old Testament. And so he believed in some of the things that were written, all the things that were written there. Okay, It wasn't a myth. Uh, it really happened. And you remember the story. God made Adam from the dust of the ground, and he formed Eve from the side of Adam. There's no mention of evolution there, right? He gave them complete freedom to roam and taste and experience and enjoy and relate. And they walked in the garden with God, their heavenly father. They both were unclothed and unashamed, unaware, without guilt and fear or any inhibitions. Totally innocent. But they had one rule that they had to obey, right? Not the 613 rules of the Old Testament that we have come to know not even the Ten Commandments, not even the Eight Beatitudes, but there was just one precept, one rule to obey, just one clear exception. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There it is. And then there was one clear penalty if they did do that, and we all know what that was, death. And along came a spider and sat down beside her. No, it wasn't a spider, okay? It actually was a snake. I don't know if you've heard this before, but uh, uh, as I was traveling here, I heard a story that in New York City, um, there was this man, and uh, he was laying in his bed, and I guess above his apartment, somebody had a boa constrictor, and the boa constrictor actually went through the rafters, and the night that he decided to sleep in his bed, which is every night, Guess what happened? That boa constrictor fell through the ceiling and fell right on top of him while he was sleeping. Now, would you freak out? How many of you would need therapy after that? <laughs> I know I would. I know I freak out when there's spiders. Thank you very much. But a snake? But don't think of a snake like we actually think of a serpent. Uh, it's not a repulsive, scary, skinny, slithering reptile, but rather a beautiful, attractive, appealing intellectual, conversational, flattering, persuasive, convincing persona. And this incredible creature came and questioned the goodness of God, okay, uh, and his motives and his words and the intentions of God. And you know what? He has been doing that ever since. And he created doubt and desire in the mind of Eve, and she reached out her hand and she plucked the fruit and she opened her mouth and she tasted it and she thought it was really good and she shared it with her husband Adam and he also ate and every pain and suffering and every problem and every malfunction and every misery and every evil that you have ever observed or experienced and even the burdens that you carried into a place like this guess where it all started that day right Romans, the fifth chapter, in verse 12, says this. It says this. Therefore, just as through one man sinned, entered the world, death also came. It is, like, really hot up here. Is it because I'm really nervous? Yeah. Does, Rick, you want to finish this sermon? Because <laughs> does Rick not ever stop smiling? It's like he talks like this. Hi, John. <laughs> Rick, you're an incredible guy. I bet you're so contagious in your spirit, man. I like that about you. But anyway, in Romans, the fifth chapter, the word is don't kiss him because he has, I don't know. Anyway, verse 12, it says this, Romans, the fifth chapter. Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world. Is this another one? Should I just pour this on my head? I ask for water, and you guys need a lot of water, so anyway. Guys, thank you. You know, we're all family, right? <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12. Oh, there it is. I could just read it from there. No, I can't. <laughs> and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And because of that sin, the ground was cursed. There were thorns, thistles, sweat of the brow. Adam and Eve's relationship was changed, and most of all, death entered the world. Death entered the world at this time. One of our enemies, amen? I can't tell you how many times I have done funerals, and, uh, you know, we, Rick and I were talking about how 
you know, we, we, we like to do weddings. Sometimes we don't like to do weddings because you only get one chance to do that. You don't get a do-over. I hate funerals as a result of this is because I hate death. And I hate people uh, that have to suffer as the result of death. I just hate that. Uh, and it bothers me. And I'm pretty sure you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm pretty sure we all do. And everyone in this room, you, me, someday, we're all going to go back to the dust of the earth which we were created. And of course, Satan, the serpent, was cursed. Listen to what it says in Genesis, the third chapter, in verses 14 and 15. It says this. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise or crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. Don't miss that. Because in the midst of this story, God gives this incredible hope of grace. And he says, I don't want to leave you by yourselves, okay? You've done something bad, and guess what? I'm going to share with you uh, that there is going to be hope that's going to come. And this is the first glimpse of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's how this story takes place. Somebody's going to come, and somebody is going to crush Satan's head, right? Uh, they didn't know who it would be. They didn't have any idea that the creator... Uh, Jesus Christ, who was present at creation, would be born to a woman and would crush Satan's head on Calvary. They didn't know that was going to happen, but they knew that somebody was going to come and somebody is going to crush Satan's head. Theolans, the, uh, uh, the, uh, <laughs> theologians okay, call this the proto-evangelum. Okay? That's a big fancy word for uh, the first gospel. And it's a first glim glimmer of where the story is going to go. Somebody's going to come. Somebody's going to crush Satan's head. And there's this glimmer of hope that takes place. Man's choice resulted in man's separation from God. And you know what? It broke God's heart. Okay? Uh, but that's the way it was in the beginning. And in Genesis, the third chapter, in verses 23 through 24, it says this. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And here you have them leaving beginning number one uh, in Eden. And now we go to beginning number two, which happens to be east of Eden. It's a new beginning for Adam and Eve after they have been cast out of the Garden of Eden. It's not a mulligan. It's not a do-over. But it's another beginning that God gives them outside of the garden, away from God's presence, um, but not entirely without joy. They had the satisfaction from working the ground. They had each other to comfort and console. They felt the incredible joy in, in, this, in the searing pain of parenthood and the celebration of the birth of their firstborn Cain to the horror of Cain killing Abel. And you have the first murder that took place. But then they had the comfort that they felt when their third son, Seth, came along. And they had more children that were born to them as well. So you have beginning number two. Creation number two is underway. They experienced the extended version of ex an extended family. And Adam lived to, what, 930 years. Can you imagine? 930 years. I came across something the other day. I don't know if Rick or Clyde or any of us has ever done this before, but have you ever looked at a timeline before uh, of the events that have unfolded and how, people how long people lived and what have you? Uh, it's a good study to do and to look at. Um, I don't know if you've ever done that, but think about it. If you live to be 900 years old, that makes you a contemporary with many of the characters who were born long after you. And if you take the time to camp out and read in Genesis, the fifth chapter, and read about the descendants of Adam and Eve, the story is really amazing. I mean, think of who your contemporary would be if you lived that long. For instance, uh, the years of man was capped off to about 120 years after that. Maybe to help us to get on board with this would be something like this. To put it in our perspective, Abraham Lincoln 
uh, was born just over 200 years ago. George Washington was nearly 300 years. We would still be able to talk to George Washington and also Abraham Lincoln. Now, granted, they would probably be really mad at the way things are in our country, right? But we would still be able to talk to George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. And if you start to do a little bit of math here, you'll find out that Adam's life overlapped Methuselah's life, who happens to be the oldest man that ever lived, by about 243 years. Methuselah's life overlapped Shem, the son of Noah, about 98 years. Shem overlapped Abram about 75 years. Adam, the first man, could have explained the sin and the fall of mankind to Methuselah. Wow, and some of you are like, what? I didn't know these people were in the Bible. Well, they are. They're real people. I can't imagine their conversation and what they talked about. And so we have beginning number one, the Garden of Eden. We have beginning number two, east of Eden, after they're cast out of the garden. And as the population explodes, we come to a man that you'll recognize. His name is Noah. So uh, it's in Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses nine through 13. Listen to what the word of God says. It says this. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just, righteous man. He wasn't perfect. Okay. He was blameless. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. You get the picture, don't you? So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah lived in a time where the imagination of man's heart was on evil continually. I can't comprehend that. Can you? Genesis 6, 5 says this. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Here's what I want you to think about. I want you to imagine the worst spots in our country. And the world in which Noah lived might make those places look like Disneyland. Because we can think of some places, right? I mean, where I'm from, I can think of some places. And right in your own backyard, you can think of some places as well. And God said, things have gotten so evil that I'm going to destroy all of mankind from the face of the earth. Noah, I want you to build an ark, and here's how I want you to build it, okay? And uh, you're going to do it. And he gave the dimensions and the material instructions and directions to fill this ark with pairs of every kind of animal to ensure the repopulation of the earth after the flood with each species, including dinosaurs. Woo! Like, what? Well, you got to come back to Vacation Bible School, right? To find out more about that. Okay, and the story which follows is way more exciting and incredible than Russell Crowe and Anthony Hopkins could ever make on the big screen because the New Testament confirms the historicity of this event. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in verse 7, it says this, By faith, Noah, divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared the ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now I want you to think about that. Noah is, is sitting there on his front porch eating his lasagna he cooked with a torch. He's halfway through a meatball when the Lord spoke and the Lord said, boy, you're going to ha- be busy for a while building an ark from a huge wood pile. And Noah's eyes got big as baseballs and he almost choked. Well, he told his family what it was going to go down and they listened intently to him and nobody fought or fussed or frowned because nobody knew how to swim yet. Those are words from contemporary artist uh, Carmen's song. Anybody knows Carmen? I don't know. Rick, you don't even know who that guy is, okay? Or Kyle. Anyway, here's what Noah did. He preached righteousness the whole time, didn't he? He preached righteousness while the ark was being built. Here's what happened. People did not listen. Did you hear that? 
He preached righteousness and people were not listening. Is anybody listening today to God and his word? And even as Adam and Eve were the parents of all living, so that designation passed to Noah and his family. And every person on this planet, include, a planet including you and me, are descendants of Noah from one of these three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Well, they were in the ark for an extended period of time. And in Genesis, the 8th chapter, in verses 3 through 4, it says this. And the waters receded continually from the earth. And the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the seventh day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. And it's interesting that if you look at this, it gives us the exact month and the exact day when the ark comes to rest on the top of Mount Ararat. And it's interesting that if you study the New Testament and find out when Jesus rose from the dead, there's a correlation there. Because the ark being raised above the earth is a symbol of the New Testament resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's just a little tidbit there. You can go home and study it for yourself. So now you have beginning number one is over, Eden. Beginning number two, east of Eden. And now it's time for beginning number three. And that's when the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. And in Genesis 8... Verse 15, it says this. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out, bring out with you every living thing of the flesh that is with you. Birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply, multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. He took every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, not from his birth. From his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night, day and night shall not cease. And God placed a rainbow in the sky to promise. Now, we were driving here and we had a lot of rain coming here, but it seems like once we hit the Maryland border, there was no rain to be found. But we witnessed a beautiful rainbow. It was unbelievable. And every time I see a rainbow, I think about the promise of God. How about you? Anybody? Praise God. And so beginning three is underway. A whole brand new, fresh, totally cleansed by water, earth. Populated by a righteous man and his family. A man who has found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And all the animals that were on the ark were rescued a brand new start so you have creation beginning number three it's all good right huh noah planted a vineyard took a few of the grapes made a little homemade wine took a few sips then a few more sips then a few more sips next thing you know guess what we've got trouble again curses wow crazy isn't it Beginning one, beginning two, beginning three, we got trouble, we get a new start. Beginning two, we get trouble, you begin a new start. Uh, Beginning three, you get trouble, you begin a new start. Noah's family eventually multiplies and repopulates the earth. Let me ask you a a question here. Has anybody ever watched those Alaska shows, Buying Alaska? Okay, don't you love, why do you guys watch those shows? because you want to get away to like Alaska, right? And it's like, man, if I could only get away from this rat race in which we live in, I'll I'll tell you what, it's crazy around here. I live in Iowa, Council Bluffs and Omaha, and people complain about the, uh, you know, the, the rat race around there. But when you come back here, there's people everywhere. Does anybody sleep around here? There's so much traffic everywhere. Things have not changed. It's only multiplied. But have you ever been one of those people who wants to just fall off the grid and say, I just want to get away from people, maybe fall off the grid, go to Alaska or go to some other place where there's not so many people? 
get away from all the world in, worldly influences? Has anybody ever thought about that? Okay, sure. If we could just start over with our family, just get away from it all, everything would be all right, right? You know who would mess that up? You would, and I would. It wasn't just Adam and Eve. It wasn't just Noah and his wife and their sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. It wasn't their, their wives, Mrs. Ham, Mrs. Shem, Mrs. Japheth. It wasn't just those people who were preserved on the ark and the animals who were preserved on the ark. Guess what else that came through the ark? Guess what was preserved? Man's evil heart. Okay. So Noah's family multiplies and repopulates the earth. Then comes the famous Tower of Babel story. You can read about it in Genesis 11 where it explains the different people uh, and groups and languages which are referred to in Genesis 10. And people are scattered all over in different places on the face of the earth. And all those stories make up the beginnings of the new story. And here's what I challenge my congregation, which I would challenge you to, is you have to see yourself in the story. Right? You have to see yourself in the story. So what are some takeaways that we can have here this morning? Well, let me just say this. They say that there are five elements to a good story. Characters, setting, conflict, plot, and resolution, or a theme. And man, I'll tell you what, you look at these stories, and you've got every single one of them, right? Characters, God, Satan, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Seth, uh, Noah, Ham, Shem, Japheth. You have the settings. You have the Paradise Garden, East of Eden, the Flood, the Total Deluge, Mountains of Ararat. You have conflict. You have God and Satan, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, good and evil, love and hate, light and darkness. You have plot. You have God's work, Satan's rebellion, God's restoration. The theme is God's unyielding, unstoppable passion and love for his people. So you got all the elements of a good story, right? But here's how we put it all together. Because this is the way I look at it. God builds. Satan destroys. Man chooses. And God redeems. That's been going on since the beginning of time. I'm going to say it again. God builds. Satan destroys. People choose. God redeems. Can you guys repeat that with me? If you're all on board. Let's, let's all say it together. God builds. Satan destroys, people choose, God redeems. Listen to these words. Romans, the first chapter, verse 20. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know what that says to me? God shows himself everywhere. And none of us have an excuse, right? Right? Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Revelation 12, 9 says this. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil, and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast out to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. God builds, Satan destroys, people choose, God redeems. 1 John, the third chapter, verse 8 says this. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested or made known that he might destroy the works of the devil. So you start to see the story unfold, don't you? It all fits together, doesn't it? You're in the story because Genesis is the story of us all, right? It is. So let's take a few things home with us here this morning, okay? A few takeaways. Number one, as you look at these stories and you put them all together, you know what I see? Here's what I see. How valuable we are to God. Amen? When you disconnect yourself from God, you probably look at yourself and say, what's the use? I see people all the time just going to and fro, doing whatever. They're just existing here on earth, right? But the moment you start to disconnect yourself from God, you don't see the value and how valuable you are to your heavenly Father. 
that God created all this for humanity and that when we mess it up, guess what? We get to do over, start over. And then we mess it up again and we get to start over. And we see the lengths at which he will go to make this happen. And self-esteem, real self-esteem doesn't come from what we do or what kind of job you have. It comes from God, your heavenly father. You're valuable to him, whether you believe it or not. And that's what I get out of these stories is that you and every person is valuable to God. Okay, number two is this. Not only are we valuable to God, but it reminds us how vulnerable you and I are as people. Adam and Eve in a perfect environment, get this, with just one rule. And we get on top of them, don't we? We say, why couldn't you just obey one rule? Come on. And we've suffered as a result of that. One command to obey, and guess what? They blew it. Then after that, we saw what happened with their son, Cain, and how he killed his other, their other son, Abel. You would think that you would see how bad it was and that you would have a fresh start, but that's not the case. And so they had this new chance, and guess what? They blew it after that. And then there's Noah, and Noah gets away from all the worldly influences. It's all removed. It's just him and his family, and they get to start over, and guess what happens? They blow that. And then his family starts out again, and they spread, and they blew it again and again and again. There's a tree, a piece of fruit, a little taste, a sibling rivalry, a sip of wine, tower building project. Really? Come on. Can I just say this? Do you see yourself in this story? Because this is the story of all of us. Because here's what I see. I mean, I see myself. In your most honest, less self-righteous moments, do you ever get a glimpse of yourself and say, John, why did you think of that? Or why did I say something like that? Anybody? Let's be truthful and honest here. You're like, where did that come from? True? I don't know if you ever heard of a lady by the name of Madeline Truegood. Uh, This was years ago, and um, she was this lady, and she was videotaped in front of a grocery store somewhere, beating up her four-year-old little girl. Do you remember the story? It was caught on tape. It was plastered all over the news, and people were like, wow, how could she ever do something like that? Well, they interviewed her after that, and they asked her, they said, what did you think about when you saw the video of yourself beating up your four-year-old little girl? And she said, oh my goodness, I looked at that video, and I was like, I was a monster. I was never raised to do anything like that. That was crazy. That really wasn't me. And we look at that and we say, how could somebody do that? But the reality is this, we're all capable of doing something like that. Amen? Sure we are. And we look at ourselves and we say, but how could I think of stuff like that? Why Did that really come for me? And, and, and that's what the story shows us. The story that I just talked about shows us how valuable we are to God. But it also shows us how vulnerable you and I are. And the third thing is, wrap this up it shows us how volitional we are and that word volitional means it just simply means you have free will i have free will you have a choice i have a choice you have a choice to do good you have a choice to do bad you have a choice to come here on a sunday morning or not come here on a sunday morning you have sinned because of your choices and i have sinned but god wants to redeem us and the question is this Will you just let him? Because some of you are still struggling with that, right? It's like, man, why do I keep doing some of the same stuff over and over and over again? Well, you have a heavenly father who is, is there and has this incredible amount of long suffering. <laughs> and he wants you to get it right. Uh, but he also has sent a redeemer for you. See, that's part of the story. You know the lengths of which he has gone to crush Satan's head and provide redemption for you. That's what I love about that story way back in Genesis that somebody's coming and somebody's going to crush Satan's head. And that person was Jesus Christ. So you have God is still building. 
God, Satan is still destroying. Man is still choosing. And God is still redeeming. God is still building. Satan is still destroying. Man still chooses. And God still redeems. And God wants to offer you redemption now. Okay? Now, I don't know. I know a lot of people in here. We have some crazy stuff on how people became Christians. I remember when George Zabatakis and Cindy, we went to a, look at this. We went to a party at your house, and we, it was a costume party, wasn't it? And George wasn't a Christian at the time. And so we're all dressed out, and Lori and I were dressed out in these clown outfits that we made. Do you remember that, babe? And I don't know what you were, George, but we were sharing the gospel with you, and Brian was there, and everybody was sharing the gospel, and you decided to make a decision that day. Do you remember? And you know what we all did? We all went down to the church in all of our costume gear. We have pictures, don't we? And here we are up in the baptistry, and we're, I'm in a clown outfit. George was in his outfit. Everybody was in their outfit. And George is accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, and we baptize him into Christ, and he comes out a brand spanking new whatever, right? <laughs> All of his hair turned gray that day. <laughs> but we have some incredible stories, and that story can be yours too because it's the same message from the beginning. God wants to redeem you. I know there's a lot in here that are already Christians and have already uh, confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but chances are not everybody in here has, right? True? When we were coming here, we saw so many wrecks on the way, two or three. Every time I go by one, I think, you know what? I hope that person survived. I hope it. I hope they survive. You probably heard this. Rick has probably said it. Clyde has said it. Whoever preaches from this pulpit, they probably said it. None of us are guaranteed another day of life, right? You could walk out of here today, and Rick will be doing your funeral tomorrow or the next day. And we're like, only if they would have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Only if they would have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and believed that he was the one that died for their sins. Believed that he was... He died and was buried in a tomb and he was resurrected from the dead. Okay? And that only if they would repent of their sins and be baptized into a watery grave of baptism for the forgiveness of their sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If only, if only, if only. I have done funerals where I'm like, man, I wish they would have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ because it would make this funeral a whole lot easier. Right? And you're thinking, well, you know what? I got another day. You don't know that. And I don't know that. Before I left uh, Glen Burnie, the first Christian church, Lou Parson and I, we used to go on calls a lot together. And um, I still remember this story, and some of you remember it. I went to a crisis counseling class at uh, Cincinnati Bible Seminary to learn how to do crisis counseling because I didn't know how to do any of that kind of stuff. Sure enough, we get back here, and you guys all remember Gary, right? Okay. Um, went to that class with him, went back here. He went to, to do a revival, and there was this young man on the eastern shore who wanted to take communion, and he was in Johns Hopkins Hospital, and he wanted to take communion that day. But he was in the hospital because he had a heart problem going on. And so Lou and I said, well, yeah, we'll take him communion, and... Uh, you know, he didn't want to miss the Lord's Day and miss meeting around the table. So we, we took him uh, communion. And as we arrived there at the hospital, the family was there and they're all sitting around and they're just talking, having a good time and they're drinking pop and stuff like that. And we went back to give him communion, but they wouldn't let him let us back in the room. And so uh, we decided to leave and we decided to go get a Coke, Lou and I. And so we went down to the lobby to get a Coke and we came back and all of a sudden the family is all screaming and shouting and crying and his fiance was crying also and we're like what the heck happened everything was just perfect and then we come back and we were only gone like five minutes and what had happened is the reason why they wouldn't let us in the room is because he had died and we didn't give him communion and so we were like freaking out and we didn't know what to do and i say all that to say this you never know folks 
But eternity is a long time. And God builds, Satan destroys, man chooses because that is your choice. And God redeems. And that's one of the reasons why he prophesied in Genesis, the third chapter, that he was going to send somebody to crush Satan's head. And that somebody is Jesus Christ because he wants to redeem you and to forgive you of your sins so that you could be in a right relationship with him starting today. Okay. now, for those of you who have been Christians for a long time, oh, that Genesis stuff, I know it like the back of my hand. I've read that story time and time again. It's real stuff, folks. It's real. And our faith is built upon the foundation of Genesis and the rest of the Bible. Now, some of us get older and we have a tendency. Here's what we do. Oh, we come to church, sing a few songs. Don't read God's word. No, just just hang on to our past laurels. Am I right? I know because I'm there too. It's like, you know what? I preach sermons and sermons and sermons and sermons. Like, I don't need to read God's word. Oh, yes, you do because faith comes by hearing. And so the more you hear the word of God, the more you're in the word of God, you build up your faith in God. So in those times, you can hold on to those promises of God, right? Because it's real stuff. I'm going to ask you to stand and let's pray together. It's been nice hanging out with you. Had a rocky start? (laughs) That's okay. Do I get a do-over, Rick? Will you have me back? Well, you get me back on Monday. So, right. Listen, I know vacation Bible school is like for kids and stuff like that. I'm just going to give you a little little commercial here. But you know what? There's There's adult classes, too, that we can learn about the Bible as well. Back at our church, we just got over our vacation Bible school, and here's what the adults say that help out and hang out and learn themselves. They say, it's like a revival for adults, you know, and uh, we get pumped up and we can go out into the world again. So anyway, let's, let's just pray. Come back and let's hang out together. They got a vacation Bible school going on. Um, anyway, God, thank you so much uh, for this church, Father. Thank you, Father, that I myself and my wife and and many others, uh, many, many years ago, Lord, uh, the gospel was represented to us. And and we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and we became Christians and our lives have never never been the same, Lord. I just pray, Father, that if there's anybody here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, never have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, never have confessed Him and been baptized, Father, that this would be a day that they would do that and become right with You. Thank You, Father, that You sent Your Son, Jesus Christ. And thank You, God, that we're able to hang out together. We pray, Father, that as we leave this place, that we'll be excited to serve You. In Jesus' name.